Okay, hi everybody. Today we're going to be talking about the smallest subunit of life, which is the cell. And uh, first, let me remind you that we had discussed in an earlier lecture uh, that life was organized. And often we see repeating themes of this organization and using our knowledge of current evolutionary biology, um, we can then piece together uh, how one kind of organism might be related to another. So more on that later for now. Um, here are basically all the groups of life. And this might look like a lot, but keep in mind uh, that these are just the larger groups. Um, so for example, if we zoom into animals, uh, you would see that many of these um, have smaller groups within those, such as mammals, fish, and insects, and reptiles. And if we zoom into plants, you might see pine trees and roses and corn and things of that sort. So in total, there are probably 10 million of these branches or more, uh, but don't worry about that. In bio one, uh, you don't have to learn this entire list. The majors, bio students, a little bit different story. And we go into a lot more detail on that, um, but we'll go into some of these. I just want to show you sor sort of all of them at once. We can take all these forms uh, of life and then break them down into three very distinct categories we call the three domains of life. And those are the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukarya. And again, this is called the three domain system or the three domains of life. You might also recall that we talked a little bit about the cell theory, that all living things are composed of cells and you can break cells down into smaller parts, which we'll do today and talk about those. And those parts themselves uh, can be broken down, but the parts themselves do not meet the criteria of being alive. They have some of the components of being alive, but not all of them. So maybe they can reproduce, but they don't utilize energy or maybe they utilize energy, but can't evolve. Um, and can't change over time or response to stimuli, the parts that is. However, cells, the smallest subunit of life, are capable of doing all those criteria. So we'll talk about that more. So there are basically two types of cells in a living organism. Um, and those are prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells are those that have no nucleus uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. And a eukaryotic cell does have a nucleus. So what's a nucleus? Well, a nucleus is an organelle that we often call the brain of the cell. And that's where the DNA or genetic code is. That's where your genes or genetic makeup are. They're inside the nucleus. And uh, where there's DNA, uh, then there's genetic code. Prokaryotic cells do have DNA and genetic code, um, but instead it's not enclosed in the special container. Um, instead, it's sort of floating around the middle of the cell. And we'll talk about that more as well. So connecting our tree of life to this cell idea, we find that uh, of the domain system, the bacteria and the archaea are both made up entirely of prokaryotic cells, whereas the domain eukarya, as the name probably implies, is, well, made up of eukaryotic cells. Okay. This is my typical eukaryotic animal cell, and we'll start with uh, that, talking about the basic parts of it. Uh, and people and dogs and cats and birds and all of these and many more are types of animals. Uh, animal cells, being eukaryotic, have a nucleus, as we talked about before. They also have a plasma membrane, uh, which helps regulate what moves in and out of a cell. Um, and mitochondria, which are often called the powerhouse of the cell because they are able to convert the food we eat into a special form of chemical energy we'll talk about later on called ATP. There are other organelles in an animal cell that are important, but we're going to come back to those later because many of them are shared by what we see in plant cells. Next, we have another type of eukaryotic cell. So both plant cells and animal cells are both eukaryotic. So keep that in mind. That's something that for some reason people seem to miss. So like animal cells, plants also have a nucleus. They also have a cell membrane and they also have mitochondria. Um, they also have ribosomes. Ribosomes are found in both animal cells 
plant cells. And f in fact, we'll find them in prokaryotic cells as well. They're a little bit different, but they do the same kind of function. And the ribosomes are used for building proteins. Um, but plants have some other important organelles uh, that we don't find uh, in animals. So first, plants have this special organelle called a chloroplast. And the chloroplast, of which in one cell there could be many of them, chloroplasts function in a similar way to mitochondria with one big exception. And that is the chloroplasts utilize energy from the sun and carbon dioxide, and they take the energy from the sun and the carbon dioxide molecules, and they generate chemical energy by combining those two. And we'll talk about that more later on. And that is kind of a unique thing that plants do that you don't find in animals. In many ways, plants are one of the most important organisms uh, to all of life on earth because of this ability to take sunlight energy and turn it into chemical energy. They aren't the only organisms that can do that, but they are one of the very few. Plants also have a structure called a cell wall, and it is made out of a carbohydrate called cellulose, and it is outside or exterior to the cell membrane or the plasma membrane. The cell membrane and the plasma membrane are the same thing. However, the cell wall, which sounds kind of similar, is a distinctly different structure, and it helps plant cells maintain a strong structure um, depending on how water changes or how water moves in and out of the cell. Plants also contain a large central vacuole that's used for storing excess liquid, and this organelle is also not found in animals. Animals in, in some cells may have a kind of a smaller one, but not a very large central vacuole like you see in plants. All right, probably everyone is familiar with the basic eukaryotic organisms such as plants and animals. Fungi is another group that contains organisms such as mushrooms, um, so that is probably not hard either. But when we hit this group that we call protozoans, that becomes a little bit tricky. Protozoans are one of those things that we had a hard time classifying uh, over the many years in my uh, career as a student uh, and, and even teaching. So in the last 10 years or so, I think they finally have come up with a very good conclusion on how to organize these. And that's what we'll show you here today. So currently they're organized so that there are actually many different groups of these things we call protozoan. Some are closely related to animals, some are closely related to plants and so forth. As an example, one type of protozoan in this big group is called plasmodium, and plasmodium is a type of apicomplexin that causes the disease called malaria. Uh, this is a blood disease transmitted by the bite of a mosquito, which kills uh, millions and millions of people each year, primarily in tropical regions of Africa, but also parts of Central and South America and other places as well. So that is one definitely that you need to know. You don't need to memorize all the different groups of protozoans. We're just a couple that we'll focus on that you come across plasmodium just happens to be one of those. Uh, relative to size, there's a couple things we could talk about here. If we look through our microscopes, by the way, we typically have in class um, what we call a binocular compound light microscope is what we generally use in class. So that's what you see in here in terms of what we call the light microscope right there. And you can see that with our microscopes, we can see things that are as small as about 100 nanometers uh, to uh, as large as maybe, you know, maybe three millimeters or so in that sort of range. Um, so if you look at a typical plant and animal cell, you can see relative to say bacteria or viruses, that these things are, you know, somewhere 10 to 100 times larger. So just to give you a sense of how large these are, and if you remember in lab, if you saw this in lab, um, the cells that we looked at were small, but you could really see them pretty well. And if you had a chance to look in the back at the bacteria under the slide, you see they're very, very tiny, um, even on the highest uh, power. So we can see uh, that cells are small, and that's probably not a big surprise, but looking at the animal cell and plant cell, you can see they are much, 
larger than they are bacteria, and in fact, bacteria about the same size as the organelles, such as the mitochondria found in your typical eukaryotic cell. And it turns out later on, maybe we'll discover there's a reason for that, which is kind of interesting. Next, we have prokaryotic cells, and prokaryotic cells are small. Uh, they have DNA and genetic material, but it's floating around in the middle of the cell in the cytoplasm. And the prokaryotic cells, such as bacteria, have ribosomes, uh, but they're a different kind of ribosome. They're a smaller ribosome, and that becomes kind of important because when um, a person gets sick, there are certain kinds of medication you can take that will say block a cell wall formation or will block the ribosomes from working. And they work differently on bacteria than they do eukaryotic cells. And that's important because otherwise you'd be taking medication that might kill the bacteria, but it might harm you as well. So the goal is, of course, when you ever take uh, any kind of medication or design a medication is trying to um, hit some particular target, maybe wipe out a particular kind of bacteria, but also not damage your patient, okay? Prokaryotic cells also have a cell wall, but it is different from the kind of cell wall that is found in plants, and instead they have a cell wall made up of another type of polysaccharide that is called peptidoglycan, okay? So that's an introduction to cells, and I hope that gives you a good start on learning the basic structures of prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells.